especially a 10 year journey home. For those who weren't here last time, as everyone here in the room, the Odyssey is part of an enduring story. So in 1300 BC, we had the Trojan War, which is believed to be an, actually believed to be an actual war that occurred. And about 600 years later, Homer writes the Iliad about the Trojan War. And the Trojan War is a fight between the Greeks and the Trojans, and it goes on for 10 years. Ultimately, the Trojans lose, the Greeks are victorious, and one of the characters in the Iliad is Odysseus. And he then spends 10 years getting back from Troy, you can see, to Ithaca. But rather than taking the direct route, he faces many, many trials and tribulations. And that story is told by Homer in the Odyssey 25 years later. So the first is a group quest, the second is an individual quest. Following on from that, we've got Aristotle, who writes his poetics in 330 BC. And in that story, he's talking about how to write a good story. And he's criticizing and leaning on Homer's Odyssey and the Iliad. And he's also talking massively about Sophocles' Oedipus Rex. And that's going to be the topic of the next Solvay Thursday. And we've got the Aeneid, written by Virgil in 30 BC. This was written in Latin, whereas the Iliad and the Odyssey are written in Greek. And it signaled a shift in power between the Greeks and the Romans. Virgil was using the Aeneid to help establish Italian or even Roman culture. And in that, the character Aeneas is from the Iliad. So he's one of the Trojans who are defeated and he leaves and then he goes to ultimately set up Rome. So still seeing this story continuing. And then we've got Dante's Divine Comedy. And this was uh, considered to be one of the major texts of the Italian Renaissance, partly because he chose to write it in his local dialect, Tuscan, and lots of other artists chose to write in their local dialect rather than writing in Latin. And in that, the protagonist takes the Aeneid with him down into the underworld. So again, it's a follow-on story. Paradise lost Milton, power is shifting <laughs> towards the British Empire. And in this, he's structuring his book in the same way that the Iliad and the Odyssey, and indeed the Aeneid is structured, where there's a power struggle between two sides. But rather than looking at the Trojans and the Ithacans, or the gods and the mortals, which is how the Iliad and the Odyssey are structured, for Paradise Lost is a battle between God and Satan, between good and evil. And then finally, we've got James Joyce's Ulysses, which T.S. Eliot cites as being the best book, best modern book, ever written, and Ulysses is a translation of Odysseus, but a translation from the Greek as opposed to a translation from Latin. So we've got this story that travels all the way through time, right up to the current day. And for anyone who does stick with Soul Day Thursday for the whole of the first season, they will have a broad understanding of how the Western imagination has evolved from how it was seen by the Trojans and the Greeks, back with the Iliad and the Odyssey, right up to the current day. It's a very exciting story. I have to confess, I haven't yet, I'm reading the Aeneid, I haven't yet read the Divine Comedy, Paradise Lost, or James Joyce's Odyssey. So I'm very much on this personal adventure myself. And as it goes, I'm I'm researching and I'm great. studying and I'm, I'm doing my best to share some of the key points. The Greek imagination, key themes. This is a bit like what happened. This is like a recap on, on the last last episode, uh, previously previously on Sol Day Thursday. These themes seem to be the most interesting, or at least those which the audience found most interesting. So first of all, fate and destiny. We tend to assume that fate and destiny are two of the same thing, but they are distinct concepts. And you can see this by saying he met his fate, and they're comparing that to destiny. She pursued her destiny. With fate, we don't have freedom. It happens to us. Whereas with destiny, we have freedom, and that's where we have our free will and an interplay between, between good and evil. Second thing to note is there's a dual reality, the gods and the mortals, and they interplay throughout. And the gods themselves sit below good and evil. It's not that the gods do something and therefore it's good. The gods follow what is good and bad, and then they act accordingly as guardians of right and wrong. And finally, Hades, once you've endured your challenging life where you've encountered 
fate, you've made decisions as to which destiny you wish to pursue. You then have to combat the mortals and the gods, and ultimately you go to Hades and everyone goes there. It's not much fun. You're disembodied. There's no judgment. There's no heaven or hell. And so that's a, a, a basic construct for for how the Greeks saw the world and the life that they had to live, which will become clear and clearer even as we move through the Odyssey. Starting with a summary, it's not a spoiler to give an introduction to the Odyssey and say what happens, because for all of the Greeks, this was mythology, everyone knew it. It's just that Homer told the story really, really well. And so now I'm gonna tell a, a quick summary of the story. Odysseus is returning home, as I've already mentioned. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, will help him. She's been chosen to help him because she's the most strategic, as in she is the one who is the best at coming up with strategies, as indeed is Odysseus as a morsel. Telemachus is his son. Penelope is his wife. And they're both at home waiting for him to return. But whilst they're there, they are facing strife in Ithaca, where he is king, or at least he was king whilst he was there. And the strife that they're facing is that there are 100 men all trying to take Penelope's hand in marriage. And they're there saying, look, Odysseus has been gone 10 years. He's clearly dead. Marry me. And let's, by the way, get rid of your son Telemachus because he's not as great as Odysseus and you're going to have a better son than me or a better daughter than me. So that's the strife that they're facing. Odysseus goes on this huge journey. And then when he gets home, he can't go and face these 100 suitors because he will be overcome by their power. So he uses trickery, he disguises himself to get close to his family and to get close to the suitors as a beggar. And before going straight into the palace, he meets his son Telemachus and he devises a plan for how they're going to overcome these suitors. And the plan broadly is that they go to a banquet with Odysseus disguised as a beggar. And when they're at the banquet, they ask some of the servants to hide all of the spears of the suitors and lock them away, lock the doors. And then Odysseus and Telemachus go on a killing spree and they literally decimate like a hundred suitors, which is one of the criticisms of the, of the Odyssey and Odysseus himself is that he's too brutal. Um, he doesn't show much mercy. And one of his character traits is that he's, he's much enduring, he's ever suffering Odysseus. And this much enduring, ever suffering these words constantly come as you're reading it before anything that he does. And it's this idea that he was born much enduring. He was born ever suffering, as opposed to Achilles, who was born quick footed. He was born the strongest and the fastest. And whilst also being much enduring and ever suffering, he's also many minded. He's, he's a man of deceit. He's a man of cunning. He can't use his strength to overcome the hundred suitors, but he can lock away all of their spears and then overcome them through through trickery and this is perhaps summed up by his genius in inventing the idea of the trojan horse most people will be familiar with the idea of the trojan horse but just to briefly summarize it after this 10-year war still the greeks haven't managed to overcome the trojans and so odysseus says look why don't we give them this beautiful horse and so they give this huge horse the Trojans aren't sure whether to trust it, but they look at the beach and all of the ships have disappeared. So they believe that the Greeks have sailed home and given up the fight. They take this huge horse into Troy. Who's inside the horse? 50 of the best Greeks who come out of the horse in the dark of the night, open up the gates, the ships have come back, Troy is destroyed. So he's got that as his as his um, sort of pin-up story and it is... It's a classic. Everyone knows it even now, two and a half thousand years ago, two, two and a half thousand years ago, which is fairly impressive. And here I've chosen a few words that I think sum up the story. It's about adventure. It's about endurance and survival. It's about schemes in order to bring about that survival. It's about loyalty, family and glory. And glory is something that's in both of the stories. And so is adventure. Moving on to more themes, chaos eternal. We know in the Iliad where there's a 10 year war that to expect lots of chaos because it's a war. But what Homer chooses to do in the, Odys in the Odyssey is to say, well, yes, there's chaos at war, but there's also chaos at home. There's no safe space. 
there's been no authority at home and as a result there's carnage there and this is a truth that is is universal i would say and anyone who's not only gardening or tried to keep a tidy room or a tidy kitchen will know it only takes a few days of neglect for chaos to <laughs> engulf <laughs> The Iliad hero is Achilles, and he's the greatest, he's the strongest, it's quite straightforward in that sense, and because he's the greatest and the strongest, he doesn't need to use any trickery. But Poem has chosen to bring a new hero into play here. Odysseus, he's one amongst many, he's more of an ordinary man, and he uses his intellect to get around the suitors, to get around all of the problems and trials and tribulations that he faces throughout his journey. But both of them promote mastery through adventure, and both of them believe that glory is a fundamental aim to have throughout their life but they've got different ways of bringing that glory about so achilles he can't return home and have glory he has to die he's given a decision either he can go and fight against the trojans he'll die in battle but he'll be the victor and he'll be celebrated as the victor or he lives and goes back to his father but he doesn't have glory so he chooses glory he chooses death similarly odysseus he has to get home. He's been the inventor of the Trojan horse. And he wants everyone to know about it. He wants to get home. People go, oh, Odysseus, many minds Odysseus, ever suffering Odysseus. But if he doesn't get home, he won't have that. So he has to survive. Some of the values that come through the, the Odyssey. So starting with the Gisthus, this is linked to the idea of, of destiny, how we can choose our destiny and that we ought to choose a path that is good, as, uh, as is in accordance with the Greek imagination. Aegisthus whilst Lord Agamemnon is away in charge of the Greek army, he seduces Penelope, who is Agamemnon's wife. And then when Agamemnon gets home, Clytemnestra, who is Agamemnon's wife, and Aegisthus kill Agamemnon. So it's absolutely brutal story. I mean, the guy's been fighting for 10 years. He gets home, he gets killed by his wife. Quite extraordinary. But here we've got a couple of lines. Your crimes are bound to catch up with you. Bad deeds don't prosper. It was not against his destiny to steal Agamemnon's wife and murder her husband. We warned him Agamemnon's son, Orestes, would take revenge. And Orestes is Agamemnon's son, as you can see. And he chooses to avenge his father. He kills not only Aegisthus, but also his mother in the name of his father. So here is this idea that destiny is in your hands. Fate you can't control, destiny you can, and you ought to try and pursue a good path because if you don't, you will be avenged and you will meet a darker path. And there's a story here about Telemachus. He is the son of Odysseus. It's not been easy for him because his father has been away and away for 10 years. He needs to try and find out whether he's ever gonna come back. So he goes on a quest. And whilst he's on that quest, he meets Menelaus. Menelaus is Agamemnon's brother. And it's Menelaus who has Helen as his wife. And Paris, who is a Greek, goes to the, go, sorry, Paris who's a Trojan, goes to dinner with Menelaus. And he ends up seducing Helen and taking her home with him. And that's why we have the entire Trojan War. Menelaus goes oh, to his brother, Agamemnon, look, my wife's just been taken. They take the entire army for 10 years to, to get Helen back. And they're ultimately victorious. So there's a message there that says, you know, don't take someone's wife because you'll bring ruin to your entire family and civilization. And then Menelaus, when he meets Telemachus, he says, you know, you, you have um, after we've dined, we'll show, we shall inquire who you may be. Bring your best hog, I'll, I'll slaughter it for a guest. All his life, a guest remembers a host who's treated him kindly. And this theme comes up over and over again throughout the Odyssey, the idea that you ought to treat your guests with facility. And again, that's a, that's a universal value that, that, that lives on today, not just in the West, but all around the world, which I find very interesting. And so hosting is rewarded. Moving on to the underworld, this was the first time that the underworld had ever been spoken about in literature. There's never before this been a, an elucidation of what might happen after life. And Odysseus goes down to Hades, as already mentioned, everyone goes there and it's not much fun. As Achilles says, it's where the dead live on as if mindless, disembodied ghosts. And we have no bad men being punished, we only meet famous people, and there aren't many monsters. And what's interesting about this is that 
the Christian imagination with heaven and hell came was built on top of this imagination and they developed it further. They said, okay, there is this afterlife, it's disembodied, but let's try and bring this extra angle where we say, you know, if you behave well, you go to heaven, you behave badly, and you'll go to hell. But they didn't have this. And it, the, the Christian critique of the Greek imagination is that it's too basic. It's Whereas when we fast forward even further to a, a modern current, which is atheism, atheism doesn't believe in an underworld, nor does it believe in ideas of heaven and hell. It's, it strips it right back. So it's actually a much more simplified idea of reality than both the Greek, the Roman, and the Christian imagination. Whilst we're in the underworld, Odysseus meets Achilles, and we have an interplay here between the two heroes. Odysseus says, you must enjoy ruling the underworld. And Achilles says, no, no, it's, it's absolutely terrible. And Achilles is frustrated with Odysseus he knows that Odysseus knows that it's not much fun living in the underworld mm. but Odysseus is saying it because he's duplicitous he's trying to, he's trying to come up with this, some, some kind of good idea it's not so bad at least you're the ruler and Achilles is thinking no I'm not that kind of guy I just say it straight I think honesty is the best policy so these two different ways of, of being a hero and the other theme that's brought up in the underworld is faithfulness so we meet Lord Agamemnon we've spoken about what an awful time he had and he says to Odysseus how perfect was your faithful Penelope all the while he's been away, 10 years at war, 10 years trying to get home. And Penelope is at home coming up with ideas for how she can put off these suitors who want to take her hand in marriage so that she can wait for Odysseus to make his return. Meanwhile, Clymenestra, according to Agamemnon, has destroyed the reputation of her sex. It's very strong words there. I mean, there are lots of men who are doing misgivings and no character says, oh, that he's destroyed the reputation of his entire sex. And it's lines like this that give writers like Simone de Beauvoir, who's one of the foundational feminist authors, the fuel to decide to write a book like The Second Sex, where she says one is not born but becomes a woman. You don't have to take the reputation that is given to you by Agamemnon and many of the other authors that have come, come through the Western tradition. You can be who you want to be. And then we've got Tiresias. This is the final character in the underworld. Well, there are many others, but who I find interesting. He's androgynous, he's blind, and he's prophetic. And I'm slightly overrunning here, but the story that's, that, that isn't included in the Odyssey, but is interesting, is that, is that Hera and Zeus, Hera and Zeus's wife, are having a debate. Who enjoys sex more? And Zeus says, women enjoy sex more. Hera says, it's men. Neither of them agree. They then go to Tiresias, who's been both a man and a woman. Tiresias says, women enjoy it 10 times more than men. And Hera finds that pretty outrageous. So she makes him blind. Zeus is well chuffed. So he gives some prophecy. And what I think is of note is that Homer has chosen to make an androgynous man prophetic. And I think the reason why he's doing that is he's saying that in order to have true wisdom and prophecy, we need to have a combination of both the masculine and the feminine worldview. And then the blindness is a nod to the idea that what we see is not necessarily the truth. There is, there are, there is a depth. And that theme is brought up again by Sophocles and Oedipus Rex, where the, the prophet there is also blind. He can see whilst no one else can. After many trials and tribulations, Odysseus returns back to Ithaca, but he's still not the ruler. He has to overcome these suitors. And he, first of all, has to meet Telemachus. And Telemachus has not been having a good time. He's had no father because Odysseus left while his wife, Penelope, was pregnant with Telemachus. And as a result, Telemachus' character is undeveloped. He hasn't been able to become the man that he needs to become in order to justify being the son of Odysseus. And here, this is a nod to the idea of education through role models. It was deemed that in the Greek society and to Homer's imagination, it was very important to have characters that one could emulate. And those characters had a responsibility on their shoulders to behave in a way where it goes, do as I do, behave as I do. And that is still important now, but there is also an emphasis today since the romanticism, since romanticism and, and its evolution to teach oneself. And it's just as, as a quick, quick aside, many of the romantic heroes are orphans. So Coleridge and Wordsworth, two poets who found the romantic movement, were both orphans. And then we look at some of the characters in today's films, like Harry Potter, he's orphaned. Um, Frodo Baggins, he's orphaned. Batman is orphaned. 
So there it's more an idea that one learns through oneself and you are your own arbiter of right and wrong. Whereas here it comes from the generations from before. Then we've got Eumaeus and he is a swineherd. He looks after the pigs and Odysseus goes to him first and he's disguised as a, as a beggar and he's being helped in his disguise by Athena. Uh, but Eumaeus doesn't ignore, ignore him. He says any poor wanderer who comes in supplication, supplication being like being a beggar, is given a respect. And to such people, a small gift can mean a lot. And here Homer is talking about the importance of charity. And he's also saying that it's important not to judge people by how they seem, because there are many people not giving to Odysseus because he's a beggar, but he's actually the king of the whole of Ethica, and he would remember if you gave him a small amount in that moment. They come up with an idea for how to return to the palace, as mentioned before. And as they're arriving, they see a dog, and Eumaeus goes, this dog did have a master, but it's all too plain that he died abroad. And similarly, he says, servants, when their masters are no longer there to order them about, have little to do, little will to do their duties. And here, this is partly a nod to role models, but it's also a, mod, a nod to decay without authority. And I would say that this point has links to what's happening in the working world post the pandemic, where there's a decision being made about whether we should work from home or work in the office. And to my view, whilst I do advocate working from home because it offers a lot of freedom and the ability to get stuff done, and you know, like your washing, which is what many people say. <laughs> and, and I do think that is that is a key one. You know, you get to do what you, you avoid chaos in the kitchen, but um, which is which is great. But but then you do get a bit of decay decay at work. Tricks and schemes. So Achilles condemns Odysseus for being duplicitous. He doesn't approve of that kind of storytelling. And the closest we have to these kind of characters today. Is, is in the Marvel Universe, where we have Thor, who's most like Achilles, and we have Loki, who is most like Odysseus. And it's interesting that most people see Loki not as a hero, but as a villain. Mm -hmm. But Odysseus was definitely a hero, and, and there are heroic aspects of, of Loki. And why is it that we love him? Maybe it's because he is actually a hero. He can't be like him. He can't be like Thor, because he's not the strongest. He doesn't even have the same father. He can't, he can't wield that big that big hammer. And Loki says, I do it because I have to do it. And that's <laughs> the same reason that Odysseus gives for much of his behavior. Similarly, Penelope, who is Odysseus's wife, she has to deceive to keep off the suitors. She says to them, look, I will choose a husband, but only once I finish this piece of art that I'm working on. And every single night she dismantles the art and starts it again. <laughs> so it doesn't finish. But she's, and her, her duplicity is celebrated. Athena, she says to Odysseus, you are like me. She's a female goddess, and here this is a nod to the idea that Odysseus's virtues are feminine virtues of duplicity, and duplicity not in an evil sense, but duplicity in a necessity sense. And Thackeray, I was thinking, oh, I need to be able to back this up by something. So I did a bit of research, and Thackeray in Vanity Fair has a line where he goes, my grandma says that all of the best women are hypocrites. And it was pretty clever for him to say, my grandma says, because if he just says, I says, you are a man, that's a man talking. It's not him, it's one of the characters in the book. But by saying my grandma, <laughs> it gives it more weight. So here's talking about necessary duplicity. And then there's restraint. So Odysseus has chosen to disguise himself as a beggar, partly so that he can uh, get closer to the suitors, but it's also a nod to modesty. He could go around saying that, you know, that he's the king of Ithaca and that he's the boss and that he's the guy of the Trojan horse, but he chooses to be modest. And, this is a, a nod to, to Jesus, I would say, and the fact that he chooses to wear his sandals and to not be boastful and to keep his, keep his feet on the ground. And there's a moment where Odysseus does reveal who he is. He has to come up against um, Cyclops, who's got one eye, and he, he gets Cyclops drunk. And then he puts a spear through the guy's eye, and that's how everyone escapes. So again, he's using trickery. He's so proud of his trickery. He says, I am Odysseus. I'm ever suffering, much enduring, many minds of Odysseus. And then the Cyclops goes, oh, it's Odysseus. And he calls out to Poseidon, who's his father, and goes, oh, it's Odysseus. Look what Odysseus has just done. And Poseidon, Odysseus has still got to travel all the way across the ocean. And Poseidon is lord of the ocean. He's the god of the ocean. So he then has the most treacherous journey home which he wouldn't have had if he had shown more restraint. So here there's a question, is it duplicity or is it actually modesty? And how does modesty come into contact with duplicity? Are they conflicting values? 
justice and vengeance. The gods disguised themselves as strangers from abroad and moved from town to town in every shape, observing the deeds of the just and the unjust. Here it is the idea that the gods are the guardians of, the, of, of good and evil. And they know what just is, they know what unjust is. And if you behave in a way that's not right, they will then help you out. And here's one example. So once more, the suitors threw their sharp spears with all their might, but Athena made the volley miss. So Odysseus has locked them all in this room, but they have still got a few spears. And every time they throw these spears, they, they, they miss. And to our imagination, they, like, they miss because they're not regularly at throwing a spear. But, but to the Greek imagination, it's like, oh, they miss because the gods are on their side. They're in the wrong for pursuing Penelope. And Athena is the god that's been chosen. It's very playful. So the gods are the guardians of justice. And now we look at vengeance. So the survivors, this is looking at Troy, the survivors are all carried off to work as slaves. Pretty brutal. And the suitors are locked in a room without weapons and killed, as mentioned. And then the women who betrayed Odysseus are executed. So in his household, there are many female servants who don't follow Odysseus. They follow the suitors and they are all executed. Yeah, it's avenge without mercy is what's being advocated here. It's a very different way of approaching victory to the magnanimity that is advocated in the modern imagination. Perhaps and suffering, this is the, the final slide, um, one of my favourites. So we mentioned that, that Poseidon is the god of the ocean and that, that Odysseus has been boastful and that's why he's about to have the most treacherous journey across the sea. And there's this chapter and it's just, you get this sense, it could be a story in itself, that it's just, just storm after storm after storm and he's there on his own on this tiny raft. And after he gets all the way across, he then just is faced with a huge cliff face. And he says to himself, I'm not surprised because I am ever suffering much enduring Odysseus. I'm not, this is the fate that I have to endure. And the sea and fate in the Greek imagination are, are linked together because it's a chaotic realm where anything can happen. And it's still like that today. The, the sea is a scary place. And as much control as you can try and have over your life. If you sail the Atlantic, there are always going to be unknowns. There's always going to be face, fate to face. So he's ever suffering Odysseus. And he's dealt with Circe, who has um, made all of his men drunk and turned them into pigs. He's dealt with Cyclops, where he's had to put a spear through the eyes. He's dealt with Calypso, who is with at the beginning. She's a beautiful goddess. And he's, he's got everything that he wants with her. He, she's even offered him immortality but he turns it down to go back and, and see his wife and his family. And then there's the Sirens, another famous story where he's taking his men through on a ship and they're on the, the rocks and they are so beautiful at singing that they lure the ships onto the rocks. But again, he comes up with a scheme whereby all of his men block their ears and he ties himself or he asks his men to tie himself to the mast and orders them to not let him be untied even if he begs them so he gets he gets the best of both worlds he has his cake and he eats it he listens he listens to the sirens and he gets through the passage and plus he survives he survives beside him so he deals with a lot and that's because many-minded Odysseus prevails but whilst he is many-minded he still understands like Eumaeus understands that he although he returns home there the, the, the God will give and the God will take away. I saw this line, I immediately remembered it from the Bible, like the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And I thought it starts from the Bible, but I realize now it was certainly in the Odyssey and it was probably spoken about before then. Um, no doubt whoever read the Bible pinched it from this book. That is everything. <laughs> Thank you.